2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings 6 verses 1 through 7, just seven verses tonight, but a lot of great um, information and teaching and life application in there. While you're turning there, just um, reiterate a couple things. Continue to pray, of course, as George mentioned, our camping trip. Very excited about that. I have written all the lessons for the teens, so pray that I can communicate well to them and hopefully encourage them and strengthen their their walk with God. I'm, I'm looking forward to this opportunity to just even to know our teens more. And I'm looking, this is kind of like my last waha. You know what I mean? I'm not going to, this is the last time I'm going rappelling and whitewater rafting and caving and all those crazy things. I'm going to let the younger generation uh, do it after this. And so be praying for me, uh, not only just for safety for our group, but that I really do want to bring messages and have God work in, in these kids' lives. Uh, you know, we live in a very connected world, cell phones, computers, always on, always going. And so the rules for this trip is they're going to be a little more few and far between. So just being out in God's creation uh, just changes things a little bit. And just being around nature and, and away from the distractions of this world. So I do appreciate your prayers uh, with that and uh, looking forward to what God has for that. And that trip, continue to pray uh, for Josh and Angela. Some of you probably saw on Facebook, Angela had to go, uh, our youth pastor's wife had to go back into the hospital. And so she is now back home. So could just continue to pray for her uh, quick healing. And so um, Josh is home with her tonight and uh, he'll, he'll be here Sunday, but just pray for her and that she gets healed up quickly. Looking forward to tonight in 2 Kings chapter 6, just like I said, just seven verses. Serving the Lord in ministry uh, is not easy work. It can be difficult. It can be challenging. And, and on occasion, it can be a little frustrating. For any of you who have served in ministry for any length of time, uh, you realize that things do not always go as planned. You can have it ready. You can have things planned. You can have all your ministry set up. But when everything, when everything hits the fan and everyone shows up, sometimes you just put your hands in the air and say, Dear Lord, I have no idea what is going to happen. And so it can be difficult and challenging. Some, some of the challenging difficulties are just dealing with people. You know, when you're in ministry, you have a lot of difference of opinions. Sometimes Christians can be hard-headed, uh, prideful, arguments even about how ministry should be done and who should do it. You can go all the way back to the early church. Here is Paul and Barnabas. They get in a heated, yelling, screaming match, basically, in front of everyone. And they, they, what was that match about? What was that fight about? Really, about going on a mission trip to tell people about the love of Jesus, and they had to go their separate ways. So dealing with people is challenging in ministries. Sometimes ministry can be difficult because you don't get enough workers. Uh, if, if we offer a free dinner over in the gymnasium and I put a sign-out sheet up there, we're going to have a lot of people sign up for it. If I put a work day right beside it, I'm willing to bet not as many people will be so inclined. And Jesus even had problems getting workers because he said that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are what? Few. And so not much has changed in a couple thousand years. And sometimes, really, ministry can just be discouraged and people just quit, like John Mark. And that's why we're told, do not grow weary in well-doing, uh, lest in due season you shall reap if you do not faint. So there are a lot of reasons why serving Jesus in a ministry is challenging, difficult, and, and really, you know, sometimes discouraging. But there's one thing above all the rest that can cause ministry to come to a screeching halt. There's one thing that can kill a ministry quicker than anything else and cause it to be ineffective for the kingdom of God. And that's when God's people, God's servants, you and me, the workers, lose their power. See, without power, nothing works. You could have the nicest car in the world, and it could be the most expensive one on the lot, but if you yank the battery out of that car and you turn the key, you're not going anywhere. You can, buy the, you can leave here today and buy the biggest screen TV you possibly can. It can be HD, DVR, HBO, ESPN, all the other initials that go with all the things. But if you do not plug that TV, TV in, you're not going to have any power. You're not going to be watching any shows. It is power that causes everything to run. You know the phones that you have in, in your pockets? You can buy the nicest one, but I'll tell you what, when that hits zero and that screen goes black, you have nothing more than a piece of plastic without power. And so power is what causes everything to function and everything to run. And so this message tonight, for those of you who serve in ministry, this message 
is not about how hard you work, and it's not about how much you work. We're going to be studying the, and the power in which you serve the Lord. In Acts chapter 1, in, in verse 8, we read this about the believers and, and the power that we have. The Bible, Jesus said this, But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So without the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God gifts us, gives us our spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit of God empowers us to be a witness. The Holy Spirit of God helps our prayer life. The Holy Spirit of God helps us interpret scripture. Without the power of the Holy Spirit of God, no matter how hard you work, no matter how often you work, no matter what you put into it, you're going to be ineffective for the kingdom of God without the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so this message tonight is really for me and for you to make sure that we're not just going through the motions, to make sure we're not just showing up for our ministry, doing our little thing, and then heading on our way, to make sure that when we show up to serve, when we show up to teach, when we show up to minister, that we are doing it not in our own strength of just routine and busy, but we're really coming and serving through the power and the equipping of the Holy Spirit of God. And so this message is about a man, we're going to say about a guy, who was serving God, he was working hard. He was doing his job, but then he lost his power, and he had to get it back again. So let's see what we can learn from this section of Scripture, apply it to our ministries and our lives. So notice the widening of the place. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now the place where we dwell with you. It's too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam, a tree, from there and let us make there a place that we may dwell. So he, speaking of Elisha, says go. The prophet Elisha, as we have studied, is working with a group of men who are called the sons of the prophets. These are prophets in training. They are people who are being trained for the work of the ministry. And here, again, we get a glimpse into one of these schools of the prophets. And, and I want you to understand what is going on as we study this. You realize that even up to chapter 6 here, the nation of Israel upon which they dwell is not doing well spiritually. The overall condition of the nation is in a downward spiral. They have forsaken God. There's still Baal worship throughout the land. They're living in a cursed city of Jericho. The people have made fun of the prophet of God because of his bald head. And over and over and over again, we see the nation of Israel heading in the direction just down, away from God, away from the Lord, away from his word, no respect for the prophets, no respect for the main prophet of God, uh, Elisha. But what is amazing to me is this, that in a nation that is going down spiritually, the schools of the prophets are moving up. They have gotten to a place where they are growing and they need more room. The place they have in this section of scripture is too small. And so they are coming up with a building program. And so to me, before we move on at any place, I want you to see something very important. That even though a nation may be heading away from God's, God, God's people and God's work can still grow. There can still be room to fill out. There can still be room for more building programs. But I want you to see how they were able to grow in a nation that was getting further away from God. And, and I believe this without doubt, that they grew for a couple reasons. Number one, they grew because they were teaching God's word. Part of the reason they were in the school of the prophets were to teach the prophets what does God say? What does God's word have for us? And so Elisha, along with his predecessor, the, the guy before, Elijah, they were faithfully saying, thus says the Lord. This is what God says. This is what the scripture says. This is what God is telling us. So one of the reasons they were growing as prophets in a nation that was declining spiritually was number one on the list is they were faithful to God's word. And I believe without doubt, that that is still the key way that churches are to grow today is through the scripture. As a pastor, we get a lot of books sent my way on, on church growth. And you would, if you just want to do a Google search out there, you can go ahead and, and do a Google search or a Facebook ad 
on church growth, and there'll be thousands and thousands of different books. How to do, you know, this right, how to do that right, and how to, how to know this and know that. And I'm not saying all the information is bad, but I will tell you this. I've probably read about 10 maybe church growth books in my entire ministry, and do you know what? Most of them never even talk about nor even mention the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Now, they talk about programs, and they talk about advertising, and they talk about outreach ministries, and I'm not against any of those things, but mark this down. You can have the best programs, the best outreach, the best advertising, but if you are not preaching and teaching God's word, there is no growth. You may get a couple more people to sit in a chair, but if they come and they leave and God's word's not preached, you might as well have just gone to the movies. You might as well just gone and caught a play or something like that. God's word has to be involved as if, if, if there's to be any growth. We know how are people saved. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, the scripture says, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. There's no other way to be saved except the message that is contained in the scriptures through the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you can't grow without God's word. Your church can't grow if people aren't being saved. The Bible says even to grow spiritually. 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of what? The word, that you may grow thereby. And so you're not going to grow physically and you're not going to grow spiritually unless the church you are involved with is faithful to the teaching of God's word. Do not mistake a few more people showing up as some type of church growth. Because I'll tell you what, I remember a missionary telling me one time, and uh, he was, he, I can't remember, we're in Minot, North Dakota. I don't remember the guy. I don't remember what he said, his whole message. But, but he said this to me, and, and I thought it was very va valuable. He said, you know, when it comes to church, what you win them with is what you win them to. He said, you can have a cookout and you can win them with hot dogs, but then another church will have start a grilling hamburgers over there. And, that, and they're going to go from your hot dogs to your hamburgers. He goes, but another church will catch on. They're going to start grilling steaks in their parking lot, and those people will move from hot dogs to hamburgers to steak. What you win them with is what you win them to. And he said this, and if you win them with Jesus and you win them to Jesus, then they're going to stay in your church. And I, I was just saved like one year, and I was like, well, one, I'm hungry. And two, that sounded like some good advice. I was a babe in Christ. I'm like, listen, what you win them with is what you win them to. Hey, you can roll, you want to grow your youth group? Roll a basketball, I was a youth pastor seven years, you can roll a basketball out in the gym, call out free food, you'll have a, 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 a full group. But you stop the ball and you stop the food, you stop the teens too. See, see, what we want is good, solid growth based on scripture, based on God's word, physical growth, people getting saved, spiritual growth, you using God's word and getting into God's word. And so I believe this school is growing, not because Elijah is some, some great spokesman, not because Elijah is doing even a great advertising campaign. This church, this, this, this school of the prophets is growing because they are serious about teaching God's word. So that's one reason I, I see them growing. The second reason they're growing is this, because they are training people for the work of the ministry. Elisha, the prophet, is training other people how to be prophets. Because Elijah knows this secret uh, of growth, that one person cannot do all the work by themselves. If Elisha wants the ministry to grow, you have to train other people to do the work. It is the same thing in any ministry, same thing in any church. You can apply it, apply it to business or, or any area. You have to have people who are willing to be trained to work so that you can grow. Uh, a pastor, obviously, is just one person. He can't do it all. A staff is just one or two, three people. They can't do it all. The more people who are involved in the work of the ministry, the more your ministry can grow. I can't drive the bus and preach at the same time. It, it's just impossible. You can't be in two places. But thank God we have people who faithfully drive the bus and pick up kids. Why? Because they're involved in the work of the ministry. Whether it be our children's ministry, our youth ministry, our bus ministry, our cafe, our welcome center. It takes people being trained, being equipped, and then them getting involved in the work of the ministry. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 about the responsibility of a church and what God does. He says, and it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people 
for works of service that the body of Christ may be built up. And so part of the job of staff, of deacons, of our church leadership is not to necessarily do all the work ourselves, so that's part of it, but to train other people to be involved in the work of the ministry. And if you get a church, you get a ministry that is preaching and teaching God's word, that is training people to serve, and have a heart, or people have a heart to reach its community, then yeah, that place will grow both physically and spiritually. And so I love the fact that the last part of that verse is, why do we do all this? Why do we have teachers and prophets and, and, and pastors and, and the church leadership? Why do we train people to, to, to be involved in the work? And here it is at the end, so that the body of Christ may be built up, may be grown, may become stronger. And so I strongly encourage you, listen, listen, get involved in somewhere in the work of the ministry. God has called everyone, I believe, to be involved in the work. And if God has called you, to be part of Baptist Temple, then listen to me, then you have a part to play, and you have a ministry to be involved with. Some ministries are every week, and that's great. Some ministries are teaching ministries. Maybe you teach Sunday school and you teach every week. That's a ministry. Our soundboard uh, is a ministry that, that's on a weekly basis. Our Facebook page is a, is a ministry on a weekly basis. Our cafe is a ministry. So you get the idea. Some ministries are week, are every week. And not everyone can commit to that. Not everyone has the time. I totally get that. But other ministries are, are not week to week. Uh, we have a mat weaving ministry. And I, I, not this week, maybe next week, I'm going to bring up one of the, uh, what do they call those things? They, a loom, that's it. I knew it was something spiritually sounding, a loom, and, uh, and, and then they wind the bags in there, and they make mats, voila, that's a great ministry to be involved with, man, they meet on Tuesday and Thursday, come weave some baskets, hang out for a couple hours, make mats for the homeless, that's a great ministry, VBS, one year ministry, or, or the 3rd of July, the, the, the point is that you get involved somewhere in the work of the ministry, be, because notice what, what it says there as we read verse 2, please let us go to the Jordan and let Every man take a beam there and let us make a place where we may dwell. Who's, who's cutting down the wood? How many people are cutting down the wood? Is it half the group are going to cut down the beam? Is it a quarter is going to cut down the beam? Is it 20% of the people who are cutting down the beam? With the plan they put in place, who's cutting down the beams? Everyone, every person, everyone who's involved in that ministry. And so when they went to move, it wasn't an option. It would, it'd be like, hey, do you want to work in BBS? Oh, no, okay, that's okay. No, they were like, yeah, you're working. Here's an ax. Let's go, ready? You have a beam, and you're going to go cut down yours, and I'm going to go cut down mine. I'm not doing yours for you, and I'm not expecting you to do mine for me. We may help each other a little bit, but every person is going to cut one down. And that's being involved in the work of the ministry. Could you imagine, and, and I'm not, this, listen, you're the faithful ones. You're back here studying. You're back here serving. Could you imagine if everyone cut down a beam here? If every person on the way out signed up for VBS, if that was the, or everyone signed up to be involved in, in one thing. Could you imagine if we just locked the doors and said, yeah, you can't leave until you sign up. Sorry, you ain't got your beam down yet. We can't, we can't let you out. <laughs> Everyone's got to cut down a beam. Everyone's got to be involved. See, that's how, ministry, that's how ministries grow. Man, you stick to God's word. You, you, you start you know, teaching the scriptures. Man, you make sure you're training people for the work of the ministry. You get everyone cutting down a beam. And, and, and man, see, the ministry is not a few people. It's not half the people. The ministry is to grow and be effective. It is all the people. There is a ministry, I guarantee it, for you somewhere. You have a beam. It's your job to find it. It's your job to cut it down. Also, I want to tell you what I love about this, too is I love Elisha's leadership ability. Elisha is in charge of the school. He's the main guy. I mean, he's got the cloak. He's doing the miracles. He cured someone of leprosy just the la last chapter. And so this guy has all the, the, let's just call it the juice, the power, the double blessing. He's got everything. And yet when the people who are just the students come to Elisha with this idea, uh, here's something that, about great leaders. He listens to their idea. Is it his idea to build a school? Is it his idea to grow it? Is it his idea to have everyone cut down a beam? None of those things are Elisha's idea. Did you catch that? Not one of them was his idea. Something about being a good leader is this. Number one, you have to realize that one, not every idea I have is a good one. Be first one to tell you that. But a part of being a good leader is not that I come up with all these good ideas. Part of being a good leader is listening to other people and hearing some of the ideas that they have. 
it's not about arrogance or pride for a pastor to think, well, I know everything and I have all the right ideas. That's foolishness. That, that's folly. Yeah, I have to listen and I have to pray and I have to seek what God would have. But, but make no mistake, a lot of the good ideas that we do here are, are not me. It was not my idea to give away Bibles. I just get credit. I get credit for all the good ideas. and Sometimes I get credit for the bad ideas. But everyone thinks, well, that must just pass. Because I'm up there telling people they get free Bibles. So everyone thinks, well, that must be Pastor Joe's idea. I don't, I don't, I'm trying to think back. I'm pretty sure it wasn't my idea. But when someone said, why don't we give away free Bibles, I thought, now that's a good idea. That, you know what? If we're going to spend money on something, let's give away some free Bibles. Uh, to, to start our, our, our kids' room, walk over into the gymnasium one time. If you haven't been over there to see the kids' room we built uh, a year or two ago, that wasn't my idea. We were walking through. We were trying to figure out. I remember I was walking through with Alicia and Nick. We were talking about different things. And, and eventually, through other people and talking, they were like, why don't we just build a kids' room? And I'm like, that's a good idea. Basically, you know what? Doing the Grow Deep Bible study sheet, that's not my idea. The 3rd of July fireworks, that might be half my idea. Uh, half my idea. Uh, the things at the fair, no, those, those things aren't my ideas. Basically, what I'm just like, I just look around going, hey, that's a good idea. Let's do that. <laughs> Hey, that's a good idea. And then once in a while, oh, that's a bad one. Let's stay away from that. But to think that these are all my ideas, no, I don't want to take credit for that. We always give all the credit to God, and then the, those are just people in our church's ideas. They weren't mine. I might get credit for them. It's undeserving. I just recognize that, like Elijah, I'm like, hey, that's a good idea. Why don't we do that? Why don't we have that? Why don't we try that? And, and hopefully through prayer and through Asking God to help and to bless, God, God does those things. Ministry isn't about one person doing all the work, and ministry isn't one about one person having all the ideas. Like I said, it would be a foolish leader to think that he was the only one smart enough or spiritual enough to come up with a good plan for ministry. Good leaders, and this can apply for you at your work, you in your school, wherever you're at, good leaders listen to those around them. It doesn't mean that they'll always do it, but they should always listen. And so they come to Elijah, and they were like, hey, listen, uh, this place is too small. Let every man grab a beam. We have this plan. We want to go ahead and grow. And, and notice what Elijah says uh, at the end of verse 2. What was his answer? It's like a one-word answer. Go. I love that. A man of few words, wasn't he? They come. We have this plan. We want to do this. We want to do this. And all this other stuff. And cut down beams and build it. And what do you say? Go. Go. See, see sometimes... The great thing about being a leader is not only do you have to not do it all, not only does it have to not be your idea, sometimes you just have to sit back and, and give the people permission or support to do the things that God is leading them to do. And, and so listen, I, I, you have to be careful. You can't do too many things. You don't want to get too scattered. But man, if God leads a ministry on your heart, if God really burdens you for something and you pray about it and you come to talk to me about it and we look at it, does it fit our church? Does it fit what we're doing? Is it, is it gospel-centered? Is it gospel outreach? And if you come to me and you say, Pastor Joe, I, I have a burden. I have a plan. This is what I think. Does it fit into what the church you know, overall mission is? And if all those things line up, you know what I'm going to tell you? It'll be one word. Go. Go. Go ahead. Listen, if we can help you, we can encourage you. It doesn't mean I'm going to be right there with you the whole time. But heck, you want to do it, and God's leading you to do it, and it fits into our plan, and it's a gospel-centered ministry, and it's giving God's word and seeing people saved and ministering to people. Hey, it's probably going to be a, yeah, go. Go. Isn't that what Jesus says? Go. What? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, sometimes we want to turn everything into a big, big, complicated ministry. Well, we have to have a board, and we have to have this ministry, and we have to do this, and we have to do this, and we got to get all this. You know what sometimes you just got to do? go. You just go. Plan it big, keep it simple, go and do it, tell people about Jesus, don't make it any more complicated than that. So they said, okay, let's do it. So notice the work of the ministry now. So he tells them, all right, you want to do it? Hit it. Verses three and four. Then one says, please consent to go with your servants. We want you to come with us, Elijah. And he answered, I'll go. So he went with them, and they came to the Jordan and they cut down trees. Uh, I'm going to stop right, right there for a second. Uh, one thing out of the many that I admire about this group of prophets is that when they saw the problem, because that's what it was, we need more room. When they saw the problem, they didn't go to Elijah, the main guy, and go, hey, we have this problem, and you need to fix it. <laughs> After all, Elijah, that's your job. You're the head of the prophets. And so my spiritual gift, Elijah, is I am a problem finder. 
And there are some people who have this gift. I don't know where it came from. Their gift is to find problems. They find problems everywhere. They find a problem with this, and they find a problem with that, and they find a problem over there, and they love to come and share their gift and say, hey, listen, I want you to know, Pastor Joe, I have found all these problems. Thank you so much. I'll take care of it. Why don't you leave? <laughs> Finds itself in the old waste bag. No, but, but some people just kind of have that gift. Now, listen, problems do come up, and it's not that you can't bring them to me, but, but, but here, here's the deal. You might be surprised how much time of a pastors and people, maybe where you work too, is not spent on preaching but on problems. And most of them can be solved with a little people involvement and a little bit of initiated, initiative on people's part. So let's know some things about these people. Number one, they recognize the problem. There are problems. There are things that come up. There are things that need fixed. And they can be brought to a, a, a leader's attention. There's nothing wrong with that. So they came to Elijah and they were like, we have a problem. But when they came to Elijah, not only did they come and say, we have a problem, what else did they say? We have a solution. We have a plan. And not only do we have a plan, this is what I love about them. We have a problem, and we have a plan, and we're willing to do the work to fix it. Pro Elijah, there's not enough room. Elijah, here's our plan. Let's go ahead and cut down some trees and build a bigger place. And Elijah, here's who's going to do it. Every person's going to cut down a beam. They didn't even ask him to cut down a beam. They just had, that, asked him to go. And so I believe whether it be in your work, this is a life lesson. It, can, it doesn't necessarily be a church. It could be at, at your work. It could be in your school. It could be in your, wherever, wherever you're at. When there's a problem and you're going to address it to someone, it's easy just to come with a problem. I can do that 24-7. It takes some thought to come with the problem, to come with the solution, and to be part of fixing it. And trust me, when you do those three things, whoever you're coming to, it's going to be received a lot better than, here you go, you fix it, you do it, I have the gift of problem finding. But when you come and say, hey, I know I see something that's wrong, I have a good idea to fix it, and I want to be part of the solution, I'm willing to put some time, energy, and effort into it. Man, that's what these guys did. They were like, we want to have a part, we want to be involved in it, we, we want to, to, to make sure that we are doing, each man is going to cut down a tree. See, they knew something also, that was very important. This is what I love about them. They knew this, that no one else was going to do the work for them. No one else was going to make their place bigger, right? Do you think they were going to call the king, even though the king owed Elijah a lot, and say, hey, king, we need some construction workers over here to make our place bigger. The king wasn't going to build their, their, their college, wasn't going to make it bigger. Do you think the prophets of Baal were going to show up and say, hey, can we help you out? We want to go ahead and help you build your school of the prophets. That, that, that wasn't going to happen. No, no, no. They, they, the bail prod, they didn't want to see the, the ministry go. See, the responsibility, here's what I need us to see. The responsibility to grow their ministry was on their people and their people alone. And they knew that. So let me, let me tell you something, Christian, a couple things that you need to know about our ministry. The government is not going to come and lead people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And it's not their job to do it. We can wait on them. They're going to have, no, no, no. They're not building temple. They're not building our ministry. They're not trying to reach Connorsville with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not their job. Not going not gonna to happen. The unbelievers in the community, they're not going to start financially supporting temple. They're not going to give up their tithes and offerings here, the people who don't come here and the people who don't minister here. And you know what? That's not their job either. That's still ours. That's still ours. No. The media, they're not going to send out missionaries all over the world to spread the gospel. You think that's going to happen? They're not looking to see people send, send out missionaries and start churches. They're looking to get news. So, so here's what I need us to see. The government's not going to build our ministry. The unbelievers aren't going to build our ministry. The media's not going to build our ministry. Do you know who Jesus put squarely on, on the shoulders of sharing the gospel and building the kingdom and reaching people? Us. It's our place. We're going to cut down these beams. We're going to get to work. We're going to be involved. We're going to do it. Because we could sit here from morning to night, seven days a week, ain't no one else coming to help us. It's us. It's believers. It's followers of Christ. And if we're not willing to get out there, to do it, to sign up, to get involved, to study, to be there, to reach out, to invite our friends, to invite our neighbors, to get involved in ministry, bus ministry, kids ministry, this ministry, and that ministry, I got news for you. If it ain't us, it ain't no one. No one else is going to do it. That's what these people knew. They were like, it's on us. 
If we want to get it done, then we have to be the ones to get the ax, cut down the beam, and, and get to work. No one else is coming al along to do it. And, and that's important. Uh, listen, it's our responsibility to go into all the world. It's our responsibility to make disciples. The responsibility squarely rests upon us who claim the name of Christ, and every believer has a responsibility to find a beam and get to ball. A couple Bible verses about being involved in the work of the ministry. Colossians, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received of the Lord, that you may fulfill it. So every person it ha has a ministry that you've gotten. You didn't get it from me. Who'd you get your ministry from? It's the Lord. He puts the burden in your heart. I want you to find out what God wants you to do and go do it. I don't want you doing a hundred different things and burn out. That's not what I mean. I want you to pray about it. Seek what God would have you to do. And as God leads you, then, then you do it. You fulfill it. You cut down your beam. In 2 Timothy, he said, but ye be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of, of evangelists. Fulfill your what? Your ministry. Do, do you know us? Listen, it's your ministry. It's yours. You're part of it. That's your buses and vans out there. That's your kids' building and kids' room over there. That's your welcome center. That, that, that's your food pantry. That's your VBS. It ain't Baptist temples in the sense of a name. It's yours, and it's mine. It's our ownership. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad, to, I'm glad we have a work of the ministry. I'm glad we're not sitting here going, what are we going to do next? No, listen, we're going to camp. <laughs> We're going to be launching fireworks, signing kids up for VBS, doing VBS. We're going to be at the fair. Listen, cancel your summer vacations. I'm kidding. <laughs> but man, we got a lot of work. to. I'm, I'm glad we're looking around going, we can, even, we can reach people. We got beams to cut. We got things to build. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about those things, man. God has given us a ministry. It is ours. And, and the simple question is, you've received it. God's given it to you. God has gifted you. He has purposed you. And, and Jesus saves you. He empowers you. And he gives you all these things, not so that you can just hang out, but to find a ministry to be involved in. Claim it as your own. Take ownership in it. Enjoy it. I'm seeing these guys. I'm sure they're just, I don't think they were like, oh, no. We got to go cut down some beams. I'm sure they were like, let's build it. Let's do our job. Let's grow this thing and see how many people we can reach and how many more prophets we can train. So notice the water in, in verse 6. Of course, the best plans always go wrong. So they're going to cut down these trees. Every person has a beam to cut down. They're geared up and they're ready to go. Verse 5. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe had fell into the what? Water. And he cried out, alas, master. And here's the worst part. What was it? It was borrowed. That's why I don't let you borrow my stuff. I've never cut down a tree with an ax. I've never. And I want you to know, I never want to cut down a tree with an ax. I have a chainsaw, and that's enough work. But I, I, I picture this guy in my head. I picture this group of prophets walking down a trail, and they all have their axes with their axes on. That, that's how I picture it in my head. They're excited, they're geared up, they go right down the Jordan, and they just, this guy, I picture him in my head, he's just chopping away. I mean, he's geared up, ready to go. He says, I got a beam that has my name on it. He picked out the right tree. I think he picked out a big one. I'd have been like little sapling. That'd have been my tree. He picks out a nice big sucker, and he just starts wailing away at it. Boom, boom, boom. I can see it in my head, just wood chips flying everywhere. I see bark, the smell of the tree. He's going chop, 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 boom. And then you hear what? And he cries out, oh no. And then that horrible next sentence, it was borrowed. Have you ever lost something and have that panic feeling all of a second? Have you ever, to the gentleman here, have you ever just lost your wallet? And you're like, it's, it, it must be a maddening thing because I don't know if you do this, but I'll check the same pants three times. Like somehow, and it has never showed up magically. But I'm just convinced I need to check those pockets one more time. I don't know why we do it, but there's that horrible panicking feeling like, oh, no, I, I, I just lost my wallet. Anyone ever lose their car keys? The answer is yes, because I see people here after church sometimes walking up and down, <laughs> searching around, looking for their car keys that fell out. Ladies have forgotten their purses here. We get a panic phone call. Pastor Joe, 
I left my purse. Can someone let me in? And it's, it's phone. Anyone ever lose their phone? Oh, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Man, where'd it go? Everything's on that thing. And, and there's this horrible panic feeling w- when you lose something. So here's what I want you to see about this guy. This guy lost something very important. He lost the one thing that was enabling him to do the work. That's the only, he had the access. That's the only thing he could use to do the work. But here's what I want you to see. This guy still had options. For example, what he could have done, the axe head could have flown off, and he could have kept hitting the tree with the axe handle. Couldn't he have, if he wanted to? He could have just said, oh, that's gone. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to keep working, and I'm just going to hit the tree with the axe handle. Now, a couple things about this. He could do that if he wanted to. Would he still be working? Still be, he'd still be swinging it. He'd still be doing something. He'd still be working. Uh, would he still be you know, breaking a sweat like everyone else? Would he still be busy? He would be doing all of those things. He could be actively working, busy, sweating, just like everyone else. But here's the problem. He wouldn't be accomplishing anything, would he? Because he lost his what? Power or axe head. He could be busy. He could be swinging. He could look almost like everyone else. But in the end of the day, you know where that tree will be? Right standing right where it was, because he was busy, but he had lost the one thing that gave him the power to cut down that tree, to do the work of that ministry. Sometimes as Christians, we're going along in our ministry. We're just swinging away, we're chopping away, and here's what happens. We lose our power. We lose our cutting edge. Now, our power is not in an axe head. Our power is not even in a church program. Our power isn't in determination or organizational skills or any of those things. Our power, as we studied, is in the Holy Spirit. And what happens, just like that axe head, when that axe head flew off, what happened to it? Where did it end up? In the water. So our power as believers to do the work of the ministry is in the Holy Spirit. But the Bible says this in 1 Thessalonians, it says this, quench not the Spirit. And so what happens is you and I have the Holy Spirit of God inside us, empowering us, strengthening us, allowing us to do the work of the ministry. And then whatever we do, maybe it's we allow sin into our lives. Maybe we stop reading our Bibles. Maybe we stop spending time in prayer. The Holy Spirit of God is speaking to us, convicting us, doing all these things. And you know what we do? We take some water on the Holy Spirit of God and we what? Quench him. We drown him. That fire that was burning inside us, allowing us to do the work of the, of the ministry, we dump as much water on it as we can. And just like that axe head falling in the water, we quench and drown the Holy Spirit of God who is wanting us to serve and be involved in that ministry. We are no different sometimes than that guy. We're trying to chop down a tree with an axe handle, but no axe head. See, when you can, here's, here's what happened. If there was a time in your life where you were serving the Lord with great strength and power, where you were serving the Lord and wood chips were flying everywhere and you were excited about the ministry, you're knocking down trees, you're building the kingdom, and somewhere you lost your power, somewhere you lost your edge, and the worst part about it is, is this, that you can still be showing up and working and serving and hitting that tree, and serving in that ministry, and doing your thing, and going at it. But without the power of the Holy Spirit of God, you're doing nothing more than banging a piece of wood up against a tree. We go through the motions. We just start showing up. We quench the Holy Spirit. We live however we want when we walk out those doors. We come back in here on a Wednesday or on a Sunday. We do our little thing. We do our little ministry, and we think, boy, I'm really tired. Boy, that was a lot of work, but there's still a big old stink of tree standing there because what we did is we took an axe handle, and we just batted away upon it, never realizing we lost the power that was going to enable us to do the work. Your work for the ministry is not how hard you work necessarily, though it can be hard work. It's not how determined you are. It's not all those things. The work of the ministry gets accomplished when it's through the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit of God. And if you have lost your power, if you have lost your axe head, if you have lost the thing that was enabling you to do in the ministry, then I say let's not stand there wasting time looking like idiots trying to cut down a tree with a piece of wood and an axe handle. You know what I mean? Do you make any sense about that? You need your power to do the work. And so this guy, he, he had lost his power. 
He had lost the strength. And here's the, the worst part about it. You know what it was? Last line in that, it was what? Borrowed. It was borrowed. You know, when you lose something that's yours, it's slightly inconvenient. It can even be a little bit of a pain. But when you lose something that is someone else's, well, that's a problem. So here's what I want you to see. The gifts that you have, the ministry God has called you to, the gift, the spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit that allowed you to do that ministry, they're not technically yours. You're kind of borrowing them. They were given to you by, by, by God. In the book of 1 Corinthians, the Bible says this in chapter 12. It says, all these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes to each of them just as he determines. The Holy Spirit knew exactly what gifts to give you for the work of the ministry. They aren't yours. They're just borrowed temporarily. They're given to you for a specific purpose. And so here's a guy working away, loses his power, cries out, oh no, I lost it. What do I do? Notice the where he lost it in, in verse 6. So the man of God said, where did it fall? And so he showed them the place. So he cut off a stick and threw it in there, and he made the iron float. Have you ever lost something? Uh, I'll tell you what, this, this drives me nuts. Have you ever lost something and you need help finding it? And so you go up to someone and you say, listen, I lost my car keys. And do you know what the people usually say back to you? Where did you have them last? Listen, genius, if I knew where I had them last, they wouldn't be lost. We all agree with that. And, and, and so I don't know why we say that, but, but I, I thought about it a little bit. And the reason, I assume, unless you just have a smart aleck in the family, the reason people ask you where did you have them last is hopefully they're trying to get you to replace, replay your steps to walk back and find out where you have them. I'm sure you've done that. Now, where did I have them last? You have said that to yourself, right? Did I, oh, I drove here so that I know I had them in my car. I know I had them. I unlocked the keys so that I know I got in the house. And you start to replay that back in your mind. So what you're doing is retracing your steps to basically just find out where in the world did you leave the thing that you didn't put in your normal place, right? Everyone has everyone on the same page with that. Everyone's been looking, scouring, and trying to find out where you had it last. And so in this time, they, they, they come to Elijah, and they were like, hey, listen, I lost my axe head, and Elijah says what? Where'd you lose it? Where'd you lose it? And so the guy takes Elijah to the water, and he says, yeah, oh, over, here, over here somewhere. I, lo I lost it over there. And Elijah performs a great miracle. He takes a stick, he casts it into the water, and the iron axe head floats to the top. You know, sometimes I talk to believers, counsel with them, and they're discouraged in their walk with God. They feel like they have lost the joy of their salvation and that it's gone. They realize that relationship with God is not what it should be. And most of the times people come and talk to me, they say, Pastor Joe, there was a time when I was excited about the things of God. There was a time when I read my Bible. There was a time when I attended all the services. There was a time when I did this and this. And now I feel like I, I, I've, I've lost all those things and, and I'm discouraged in my walk and, and this and, and that. And, and you know what? When they say to me, how, they say this to me most of the times, how do I get that back? How do I get that fire back? How do I get that joy back? How do I get that passion back? How do I get that drive back? And I answer them the same old way when you lost your car keys. I ask them this, well, where did you lose it? Just, where did you lose it? Did you lose it when you stopped coming to church? Did you lose it when you stopped reading your Bible? Did you lose it when you stopped having your family devotions? Did you lose it when you stopped coming to our, our prayer time or our Bible study on Wednesday night? Did, where, where did you lose it? And so here's the big secret. Go back to where you lost it and start doing those things once again. And you know what will happen? You'll probably find your passion again. You'll probably find your love again. You'll probably find your desire to be involved in, in the ministry again. Hey, if you lost all those things and you lost your power and you've allowed those things to come up, hey, listen, just go back to where you had it and start doing those things once again. I don't think it's any more complicated than that. Pastor Joe, man, I just don't have a, a burden to reach the lost. You know what? Then get back into church. 
Get back in here. Here's some messages about reaching the lost. Pastor Joe, I lost the desire to, to be back in the work of the ministry. Well, you know what? If you'd come on Wednesday night, you'd have heard how you lost your axe head and get back to whacking that tree once again, right? You got a beam to cut. You got a beam to cut. You're not going to get a passion to serve in the ministry sitting home watching Netflix. That's not going to inspire anyone. Get back to coming to church. Get back to reading your Bible. Get back to God's house. Kick some of that sin out. Start reading the scriptures again. And you know what you'll find? You'll find your passion and your burden and your strength probably right where you dropped it off a couple of years ago. Pick it. Get back going again. Sometimes, and sometimes they like to hear that. Sometimes they don't like to hear that. But the answer is the same. Where'd you lose it? That's probably where you can pick it up w- once again. Get back to it. And you know what you'll find? That when you get back doing the things that you used to do, that that burden and that passion and that zeal and that desire, they will start to flame up in you once again. And so Elijah looks at, hey, you lost your power. Where'd you lose it? I lost it over here. And he makes the axe head float and it comes to the part. And and notice the willingness of the guy. And this is also important in verse 7. And I love, this may be my favorite part. Therefore he said to them, pick it up what? Yourself. So he reached out his hand and he took it. The prophet didn't pick it up for him, did he? The prophet didn't say, hey, look, I, oh, oh, here's your axe head, let me get it for you, and let me go ahead and put it on your axe, and you get back to the work of the ministry again. He didn't call the other prophets around and say, hey, everyone else, I need you to come around here, let's go ahead and let's dive in and get this guy's axe head for him and pick it up again. Who had, who had to pick up the axe head? The guy who lost the axe head. I'm going to tell you something, and this is the God's honest truth. No one can get that desire and passion and fervor and power back. No one can get it back but you. I can't pick it up for you. I can want it for you. Hey, you know, I want people to be involved in ministry. I want people to be in God's house. I want people to love studying God's word. But here's the deal. I can't pick up that axe head for you. You know what? The people who are here, hey, I'd love for everyone who came on Sunday to come on Wednesday. I'm sure you would too, right? It'd be nice if our whole church came back on Wednesday. But here's the deal. You can't pick up that axe head for them. You can take them to there. You can encourage them to come. You can throw a stick and have it float. You can put it right in front of them and say, hey, I'll, I'll pick you up Wednesday night. But in the end, you know who has to pick it up? They do. It's taking responsibility for your own ministry, your own walk with God, and your own life. That's what it is. Elijah says, I'll help you out. I'll be right here with you. But you know what? You got to pick it up yourself. Pick it up and get back in the work of the ministry. And you know what the guy did? He reached down and picked it up. I imagine him putting it right back on that axe, probably, or axe handle, probably gave it a little tap in to make sure it was good, right? Maybe he chose a different tree in the woods and not near the water. I have no idea. But I believe that dude got back swinging once again. I'm not asking you tonight if you're just busy for God. I'm not even asking you tonight, are you working hard for God? What I'm really asking you tonight, are you serving in the power of God? Or are you just banging a piece of wood up against another piece of wood, not really accomplishing anything? So be careful, Christian, not just to be busy, not just to be hardworking, but make sure that we have our power through the Holy Spirit. Make sure the acts is actually the axe handle, or the axe is attached to the axe handle. And that's when the trees will start to fall. And that's when we get involved in that work in the ministry. I'll just say this. It's so easy just to go through motions in Christianity. It's so easy just to show up. It's so easy just to check a box. And most of the time, churches are happy with that. If you show up, we're just happy. If, you just do, if you're just busy, I- I- I'm happy. But I want you to know, as your pastor, I'm not just happy if you're busy. And I'm not just happy if you're just showing up. And I'm not just happy if you're working hard. I want us to be a church that is working in the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit of God. I don't want a bunch of people just whacking trees. I want to see some timber falling, some people being saved, and some lives being changed. And that happens with the Holy Spirit. So find your ministry. Serve in the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep your passion. Go back to the things you were doing that that you had it then. And then we'll just watch some tree fall and see what God has to do with it. But do not serve and work in your own strength and in your own power. It's foolish. You can be busy. You can look the same like everyone else. But when the Holy Spirit of God starts to work in your heart and life, that's when you're going to see some real ministry takes place in your life, in my life, in our church. So find your ministry, be passionate about it, and do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for the lessons tonight. 
And so many things that I have learned in this study that apply to me, that as I come in and write sermons, I, I pray, Lord, that I would never just come and just try to get them done, try to meet a deadline, but the sermons that I write and the things that I study, I pray I would just make sure that I'm doing it through the power of the Holy Spirit. For our kids' ministry and our team ministry and our bus ministry, there's so many ministries that take place, and it could be easy to fall into the trap to say, okay, we got to get this done, we got to get that done. Yeah, Lord, there's, there's trees to be cut down, but let us make sure that we're doing it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, I pray for your Spirit to give us strength and power. I pray that, Lord, the work of the ministry that is before us will be done uh, by your will and your strength and not just our own. I pray that you would bless our efforts. But we'll always remember, Lord, it's you who empowers us. It's you who strengthens us. So help us to be busy in the work through the power of your Holy Spirit. Find our ministry, cut down our beam, and we trust you for the rest. And let us rely on your word and the preaching and teaching of it. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless.